Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to TBR's webcast, Disruptive Technologies and Emerging Markets, Growth Strategies of Enterprise Network Vendors, covering the results in TBR's new Enterprise Network Vendor Benchmark. I'm Allison Crawford, and I will be your host for today's webinar. Over the past year, the networking and mobility practice has engaged with our clients through our quarterly webinars to provide additional insight into the state of the market. We're excited about the launch of our new coverage and look forward to your questions about this market. Before I hand this over to Scott, there are a few action items I'd like to cover with you. First, we're recording today's session and we'll be posting it on our YouTube site, TBRI channel. We encourage you to visit this channel to watch this presentation or any of the others that we've posted. Second, we'd like to hear your opinions and thoughts on the materials we're presenting. Please any, send any questions or comments to the Q&A or chat function to the right of your screen. Scott will address them at the end of the presentation. Or if you'd like to set up a client inquiry for a more detailed discussion, please reach out directly to Scott at the end of the webinar to set up that conversation. Third, we'll send out the slides to everyone registered for today's webcast within 24 hours of the conclusion of the webinar. And as a side note, uh, we, if you, these might go into your spam folder, so uh, please look for those there and so, because we've had folks not get them. Um, you can also find these slides as well as other thought leadership pieces, webinar decks, and commentaries on SlideShare at www.slideshare.net backslash TBR underscore market underscore insight. Now let me introduce Scott Dennehy, Senior Analyst on the Networking and Mobility Team here at TBR. Scott has been working in the network and infrastructure services space for the past 15 years and has launched our coverage of enterprise networking. As this program grows, he'll use his expertise to deliver actionable insight to our clients and advise firms on how to take their businesses to the next level. And with that, let me hand this over to Scott. Thanks, Allison, and, and welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining. Uh, we're very excited about uh, the content to present to you today, as Allison mentioned, this is a new uh, product that uh, TBR's networking mobility practice has launched within the enterprise networking space. So we're very happy to share the results for the first half of 2013 uh, for this particular benchmark. But what, uh, so I'd like to do first is just level set so that you understand exactly what's covered uh, within the benchmark and, and the material that we'll be covering here today. So in terms of, of, of the overall market, and so when I refer to the market throughout the, the presentation, really what I'm talking about is the vendors that we track within the benchmark as well as the specific segments and geographies. So looking at this slide, you see the, the suppliers listed there. There are about 15 of them uh, across a variety of different segments, including network infrastructure, which we consider to be things like routers and switches, uh, storage area networking, application delivery, uh, those kinds of technologies. Uh, wireless networks, so that's uh, wireless LAN controllers and access points. Unified communications and collaboration, that includes things like uh, video conferencing, uh, IP telephony and voice over IP, uh, unified communication software. Network security, so that's firewalls and, and intrusion detection prevention appliances, SSL VPN appliances, uh, those kinds of technologies. And then last services, so all of the maintenance professional services being uh, provided to customers around the network infrastructure. And then we have the, uh, the four geographies that you see listed there. So what's important to notice is we don't include uh, the service provider or telecom segment within this. Uh, TBR has a separate part of our practice uh, that addresses the telecom uh, infrastructure market and the telecom vendors that are addressing that. So we're really just focusing on the enterprise piece uh, of the networking space. So now let's talk a little bit about what we're seeing in, in terms of the key themes and trends. Obviously a lot happening in the enterprise network space as of late, but there were really three uh, that I think are most important for people to understand today. Uh, first and foremost is, is really just how important the network has become within the IT landscape. Uh, looking at all of the new applications that are being rolled out across the enterprise, uh, the adoption of things like cloud and mobility, uh, the network has really raised its profile within the IT department and really become a much more strategic uh, part of their strategy or a strategic part of their investments 
um, and that's obviously benefiting benefiting the uh, equipment suppliers that are supplying those technologies to help enable uh, those applications to be delivered across a variety or, or in a variety of different ways, uh, both in on premise and within the enterprise and, and uh, across the cloud and, and across mobile devices as well. But in terms of the results for the first half of 2013, uh, what we saw was a, it was a, an overall market, and again, market meaning the 15 suppliers that we track in the benchmark, a total revenue of all those suppliers grew just over 3% year to year in the first half of 2013. Some of that uh, driven by what I just mentioned as far as, as the network becoming a more strategic part of IT. Uh, but if you look at, at things in terms of the market, uh, what's really aided that growth has been uh, what's proven to be an improving spending environment in some of the developed markets, mostly uh, the U.S. and Northern Europe and the continued, although decelerating, growth that we're seeing in some of the emerging markets. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get down to the geographic discussion. Uh, but those have really been the, the key drivers in, in terms of the market growth that we saw in the first half of 2013. And last but not least, uh, it's really important to understand how important services are becoming to the equipment suppliers. And uh, we'll get into this a little bit more when we get to the services section, but most suppliers now are recognizing how valuable a expanded portfolio of services or, uh, or more services capabilities can provide to their business. And we're seeing the investments accordingly, both in terms of their portfolio capabilities and go-to-market model. This slide here, just to give you a, a good visual representation of, of where the 15 suppliers are in terms of their overall strategy, and, and this really tracks two things. Number one, uh, portfolio coverage. So in other words, what is the breadth of their portfolio, portfolio from a product and services point of view? And what does their geographic coverage look like? Where is the most of their revenue coming from, from a geographic perspective? Uh, where is their, what's their ability to uh, sell their products and services worldwide, both directly and via partners? So, and what you see here really is, is um, interesting in the sense that for, for the most part, um, the vendors are really on the right-hand side of this quadrant, meaning um, they either have a, a very broad portfolio that they're delivering on a global scale, or, or they are uh, competing in a handful of specific segments but still able to drive that geographic coverage. And while over the long term, being up in that right, upper right-hand quadrant is, is probably the most desirable from an overall growth perspective, it's not necessarily where everybody wants to be. If you look at, at some of the uh, vendors like Aruba and, and Riverbed, I think they're comfortable with where they're sitting at in their individual segments, but uh, I don't think anybody can disagree with the fact that being able to, to deliver your products and services on a global scale is really critical to long-term su long success. So I think the next time we publish this benchmark in April, um, that's what you'll see. You'll see that the suppliers continuing to move to the right-hand side, maybe not so much uh, up and to the right, but certainly to the right as far as that ability to, to deliver their products on a global scale. Now we'll get into some of the specific results uh, for the first half of 2013. So what you see here is the overall market in terms of total revenue that includes all of the segments we look at and all of the, all of the geographies. So just a note on how to read these bubble charts because you'll see quite a few of them here. Year-to-year uh, -year revenue growth on the uh, vertical axis, total revenue on the horizontal axis, size of the bubble indicates uh, the amount of revenue, so that gives you a good visual uh, representation and, and enable you to visually compare the vendors to one another. The red dotted line you see there is essentially the average, so the average revenue and average revenue growth for all of the suppliers. So again, you could see quickly who's above average and who's not. But again, if we look at the market as a whole, and I touched on this at the outset, a lot of investment in some of these emerging technologies like cloud, like mobility, like security, that's really what's driving the market right now um, from a supply revenue perspective. Uh, note, obviously that's why you see Cisco, and you can kind of get used to this view as far as seeing Cisco so far over to the right and everybody else bunched over to the left. Because of that end-to-end -end portfolio they have, because of that 
industry-leading channel partner program that lets them deliver those products and services on a global scale, like I talked about earlier, is really what continues to drive their business and will continue to do so uh, into the uh, foreseeable future. But I did want to take just a minute and talk a little bit about SDN uh, as, that, as SDN really continues to gain momentum in the market, certainly from a, a coverage standpoint and vendors becoming uh, more serious about it in terms of their messaging, starting to uh, put products out into the marketplace. Uh, so SDN is certainly something that uh, we're continuing to see a lot of momentum around in the market. Uh, that said, uh, I don't expect it to be a significant revenue driver for any of the suppliers anytime soon. Uh, we, like I said, we're just starting to see some of the products come out into the market, and there will be some opportunities for these suppliers to sell more hardware around SDN, but certainly uh, it's not going to be on a large scale uh, for until we get into the 2015-2016 time frame, because most customers are, at this point are not going to be willing to to rip and replace their existing infrastructure for an SDN-enabled infrastructure. Uh, they're going to take more of a piecemeal approach, which is why you're seeing some of the vendor activity around adding open flow capabilities to existing platforms and some of those kinds of things. So this is something we expect to continue to see uh, as we get through the rest of 2013 and into 2014. So we just talked about revenue. Let's talk a little bit about margin. So even though we're seeing an uptick in spending overall, particularly in the developed markets, there's still a lot of pressure being put on the suppliers from a margin perspective. There's still a lot of fierce competition for deals, which puts pressure on pricing. These suppliers are making a lot of investments in some of their portfolio around these key technologies, which puts further pressure uh, on those margins. So there's a variety of, of different strategies that these suppliers are using to kind of combat that margin pressure. Um, but I think if you really look at the leaders in the space uh, and looking at the graph, you can see companies like Cisco and Brocade and F5, a big driver for them is, is really where they sit in their respective markets. Um, you could easily say that each one of those three vendors is the leader in their respective markets, so they're able to charge that premium pricing uh, and able to, to help drive some of that, that better margin performance. Obviously, there's a lot of other nuance around their hardware versus software mix and some of those other things, but, but in a lot of cases, the, the better market position that you have, the better pricing you can charge and the better margins you can drive. Uh, but if we look at the market as a whole and, and talking a little bit more about some of the strategies that a lot of these vendors are using to drive their, their margin performance, uh, in addition to things like restructuring their operating model. So, uh, investing in, in low-cost resources, doing, uh, getting uh, more efficient R&D efforts and, and supply chain. Uh, things around cost optimization is really critical for them. Headcount rationalization and, and, and headcount reductions go right along with that. Uh, but, that's, but in addition to that, we're seeing more investments in things like software and services, which typically do uh, carry higher margins with them. So they're really coming at the margin issue from two fronts, both in terms of the operating model and restructuring that and becoming more efficient as a company, and also investing in some of those segments that are going to drive that better margin performance over the long term, um, referring to software and services. So that's the overall market view. Now we can get into some of the specific segments, and we'll start with network infrastructure. So again, this is routers and switches, storage area networking, uh, application delivery, uh, those kinds of technologies. And by and large, what we've seen uh, and what we continue to see is, is really what's happening in the data center as, as being the big driver here. So that, that demand for bandwidth in the data center, that demand for um, the applications to be delivered when they're needed uh, and at a certain performance level, uh, that's really requiring enterprises to invest in their data center infrastructure, particularly around things like switching, uh, and that's what's enabled a lot of the suppliers to, to benefit uh, from that growth. And if we look at, at this segment as a whole, it grew about 3% year to year for the first half of 2013, again, driven by a lot of um, the investments happening around the data center. Uh, but I, I do want to talk a little bit about Cisco, because the question around Cisco is, is always, uh, are they maintaining their market share or not? Uh, and I think if, if we look at at the benchmark and in terms of the, the vendors that we track in this particular segment, the answer is yes. 
um, their percentage of the total revenue for this particular segment, meaning network infrastructure, has really been unchanged over the last year. So that indi it indicates to us that they've done a good job maintaining their market share even in the face of the intense competition uh, with uh, companies like Huawei and companies like HP targeting them and their channel partners. They've really done a good job maintaining that share and it's something we expect them to do um, as we move into next year. Next we'll talk a little bit about wireless uh, networks. So wireless is, was by far the, the highest um, in terms of revenue growth, about 16% year to year in terms of the, uh, the total revenue for all the suppliers that we track in this particular segment. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with enterprises continuing to embrace mobility as a way to not only increase the productivity in their employees, but actually drive revenue as well. So it's, and it's not just about connectivity and, and, and bandwidth and performance, the management aspect is really becoming more and more important, particularly when you talk about security and, and the whole issue with bring your own device and some of those uh, other trends uh, and issues you run into when you have a, such a rapid proliferation of mobile devices on the network. So it's not just about delivering bandwidth and, and performance, but about the manageability aspect, particularly around things like security. And then what we're also seeing is, is, is some emerging trends uh, around the, the software piece, particularly things like cloud and analytics. Uh, Cloud-based Wi-Fi solutions are, are becoming a little bit more um, interesting and, and starting to become more of a, a, the portfolios of some of these suppliers. It was a big driver of, of Cisco's uh, acquisition of Meraki late last year. Aruba Networks recently came out with a, a cloud Wi-Fi solution. So the cloud uh, is now making its way into the, the wireless LAN space. Uh, and analytics as well. Analytics is really becoming important because it lets the enterprises really understand two key things. Number one, understand their users' behavior. Um, when you're talking about things like location-based analytics and where they're going and what they're doing, and it enables them to create a better end user experience. Those are really two key things that are happening within the enterprise space. So we're seeing suppliers get much more interested in investing more in their software capabilities around these, these wireless solutions to help drive up the value and, and keep um, uh, the, the equipment from being commoditized. Next we'll touch on uh, unified communications and collaboration. So again, this is IP telephony, voice over IP, video conferencing, unified communications. And this is, uh, of all the segments that we track, this is the one that's struggled the most in terms of revenue growth. It was just under um, flat revenue growth for the first half of 13, but a half a percent decline if you look at the, the vendors as a whole. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that when budgets get tight and, and when they have gotten tight over the last year or two, these are the kinds of technologies that, that aren't often prioritized in terms of IT spending. And when you couple that with the emergence of some lower cost options that deliver some uh, or the minimum functionality that a lot of these enterprises are looking for, that just really cuts down on the revenue opportunities that a lot of these suppliers have. So as an example, uh, uh, companies using Skype for, for video chatting and some of those kinds of things that provides a, a basic minimum set of functionality that they need at a very low price point or even no price point. And that lets them get away with what they need to do at a basic level um, because their budgets are so tight and that spending needs to be prioritized in other areas. So that's really been impacting the UCNC market over the last year or two. Um, but for some of these suppliers, it's not just about generating a revenue in this particular segment, particularly when you're talking about vendors like Avaya, Cisco, Huawei that have a much broader portfolio that they're bringing to market, the spending in the UCNC area can really benefit the other areas of their business as well. Uh, as an example, if you're, if you're talking about a video conferencing type of a deployment, um, in a lot of cases uh, an application like that is really going to need uh, some network upgrading or network refreshing to help accommodate that kind of an application. So that plays very well into the strategies of companies like Cisco that have that portfolio and, and those products that they can essentially pull through uh, when they're having those discussions with clients around UCNC.
Next segment is uh, network security. So network security as a, as a whole grew about 5% year to year on the high side of, of the segments that we track. A lot of that has to do with the fact that uh, security is being prioritized in a lot of cases because uh, enterprises are, are recognizing the business impact that some of these uh, security threats can have. So in other words, it's not necessarily just about protecting uh, the assets and worried about information getting into the wrong hands. There's a business impact to that. And enterprises are recognizing that, and suppliers are using that in their messaging around their security products to help their customers understand how protecting themselves from these threats uh, can really benefit their business. Uh, and that's really been a big driver of growth in terms of, of security. Um, the other thing about security that's interesting is is of most of the segments that we look at, it, it really is one of the few that remains as far as, as customers really preferring, in most cases, to, to buy best of breed uh, versus an end, part of an end, a larger end-to-end -end type of security solution. So you know, buying a, a network firewall from you know, somebody like a Palo Alto Networks where, um, as a customer, they believe that provides the best uh, solution for them and then buying the rest of their security products from somebody else is more beneficial to them than buying everything from, say, Cisco or, or HP or, or what have you. So that provides opportunities for these smaller companies like Palo Alto and like FireEye to win deals because they have technical differentiation, because they can be a little bit more aggressive uh, you know, in their pricing tactics. That's been a, a big driver of a lot of these smaller companies being able to, to gain share in this market versus some of the larger players. And then just uh, you may notice that uh, the Dell really stands out here as a growth leader. Uh, essentially, that's based on their, their acquisition of SonicWall that they made um, early last year. So when we publish this benchmark again in April, we expect them to come down to earth a little bit in terms of the growth since they really weren't playing in this market at all uh, prior to March of last year before they made the acquisition. The last segment that we'll look at is uh, services, and I touched on services a little bit at the outset as far as becoming more of a strategic growth area for most of the suppliers. Uh, but just looking at the results in terms of the first quarter, uh, services growth in, in services actually outpaced growth in products by a little bit. It's about 3.5% or so to about 3% on the product side. So that means while there was a lot more investment in products, by and large, Customers elected to kind of maintain the existing products that they did have rather than invest in new ones. So that's really the, the reason for the, the slight differential there. Um, but from a services point of view, the strategy of, of most of these vendors is still around attaching maintenance and high-end professional services to the sales of the product. So in other words, even though there's a much greater interest in services for uh, most of these vendors, uh, a lot of it's centered around building out their portfolio in areas like consulting and enabling their channel partners to sell uh, those kinds of services uh, along with their products. Um, we will expect to see a little bit of a shift in, in some of the go-to-market model as far as a shifting towards more of a solutions kind of uh, led approach or services led approach. Companies like Cisco are a good example of that trying to to shift that culture away from a product or hardware focused uh, culture, sales culture towards a, a solutions or, or even services led kind of um, uh, kind of approach. Uh, but by and large for the foreseeable future, it's really still gonna be about attaching maintenance contracts and, and professional services to sales of, of the products for, uh, for most of these suppliers. And, and I'd like to, to bring in the SDN discussion again a little bit here because I think it's relevant to services there's still quite a bit of confusion out there in the marketplace from a customer perspective around exactly what SDN is, how it's beneficial, what's the right approach for their particular environment. So really what that, that's doing from a um, supplier point of view is providing opportunities for them to offer consulting services, to go in and have conversations with their customers around SDN, what's the right approach for them, how should they deploy it in their environment. But as we move through next year and into 2015, and some of these products that are coming to market now start to get deployed, that's when the, the services around SDN will really start to ramp up. So really now, just about consulting 
their clients. And then as products start to get deployed, that's when you'll see the uptick around um, things like deployment services and even maintenance. And then lastly, I'd like to touch on uh, the market from a geographic perspective. And if you look at the chart here, what's, what really is interesting is it's a bit of a, a um, it's a bit opposite of, of what we've seen over the last year or so in terms of, of which regions are growing and which ones aren't. Uh, if you look at North America and EMEA, they're essentially on par or even a little bit higher than APAC in terms of, of overall revenue growth, in terms of, again, including all our suppliers here. And this speaks to what I was talking about earlier as far as improved spending in, the, in places like the U.S. and Northern Europe, areas, emerging markets, places like China starting to slow down a little bit, uh, which is impacting some of the suppliers. So APAC not as, as high of a, of a growth region as we've seen historically because of, of some of the slowdowns in some of those key countries. You couple that with some better spending in places like the U.S. and Northern Europe, and then you can start to see how things will start to level out a little bit. Uh, we're certainly not out of the woods yet. Southern Europe remains a trouble spot for most of the vendors. The public sector in the U.S. Uh, is certainly going to remain a pressure point, particularly on the federal side uh, due to the shutdown. Um, so it remains to be seen on, on how this plays out over the next six months or a year. Um, and emerging markets really still will be very important uh, for suppliers, regardless of what's happening in some of these places. So Middle East and Africa is, is picking up in terms of, of activity. Uh, Brazil and Mexico are still uh, delivering a lot of, of positive results for these suppliers from a, a revenue and revenue growth perspective. So that we expect that to continue as well. Certainly no um, certainly continued investment in the emerging markets and even some of the, the second tier countries that are in some of these places, countries like Argentina, uh, Southeast Asia, some of these second tier countries um, in these emerging markets are now starting to ramp up in terms of supplier focus and investment. So with that, I'd like to, uh, to turn it over to Allison for questions. Thanks, Scott, and thanks to those of you who sent me questions, as I mentioned. If you have any questions on the materials that Scott just presented, send them through the Q&A or chat function. Scott, our first question is, how much of a presence does Huawei have in the U.S.? They said earlier this year they are pulling out of the market. Yeah, it's an inter interesting question. So uh, back in the April or so time frame, uh, Huawei made an announcement that they were de-emphasizing their U.S. business. And it did cause a little bit of confusion in the marketplace. And, and really, all they were really referring to there was their telecom business. And a lot of that was based on uh, what's been happening with the U.S. government and uh, them branding Huawei as essentially a, a security threat in terms of the telecom network. So think of, of Huawei gear uh, being behind the networks of companies like AT&T and Verizon. That's really where the focus was. Uh, we still see them very active and very uh, in the U.S. market seeing, still being very important to them. In fact, being the, the investment continues to ramp up in the U.S., and we expect them to continue to be a force here. In fact, in May, they had their first ever uh, partner summit because that's really what their focus is in the U.S. market is around the channel. So they have their first ever partner summit in May. Uh, so we, we certainly don't expect them to, to slow down at all in the U.S. market. That said, um, they certainly have a, a difficult challenge ahead of them as far as their brand uh, because I think most people really don't differentiate between telecom and enterprise. So even uh, though the U.S. government's comments and, and Huawei's comments were really specific to the telecom side, there's no question that that's going to impact them on the enterprise side. And they're going to have a lot of work to do as far as convincing their partners that, that Huawei is a good option for them because the partners are going to have to go into the customers and make the case as to why Huawei is a good option for them. Okay, we actually have one clarification that needs to be made. Um, question came through, Scott. Just to clarify for the growth rate, growth rate by region, yep. is this of the companies in the benchmark? Correct. Yep. It's just the companies in the benchmark. Okay. Um, the next question we had come through. Of the various service markets discussed, what percentage of the total market was captured with your analysis of the various vendors? Good question. So uh, we have a a different benchmark that tracks the network infrastructure services space, and there we include 
some of the IT services firms like uh, IBM and Accenture that are that are performing services around the network infrastructure. Um, tough to say exactly. We haven't done a lot of, of market sizing uh, in on the services space yet. Um, if I had to guess, we we probably got you know at least 50% of the market covered. And you know really it, it comes down to what the the focus is are on for the particular vendors that are playing in that space. So from as I mentioned, the product suppliers, it's about selling product first and then attaching services. And on the IT services firm side, companies like IBM and Accenture, it's really the other way around. It's that services, that approach, and kind of pulling through networking along with other products that are part of a broader solution that's, uh, that's driving revenue there. So uh, I can do a little bit more digging on that and see if I can come back to you with something a little more definitive. Okay. That's a follow-up. Uh, the next question we have. Which companies are most likely to make acquisitions and in what areas? I don't know if in I'm not sure if we'll see kind of the, the blockbuster acquisition as far as, as any uh, you know one particular company in the benchmark acquiring another. Um, I certainly think there is a lot of areas that are ready for consolidation. We've certainly seen a lot of that on the security side. Uh, Cisco buying source fire over the summer. Um, the wireless, I think, is is one that is certainly um, provides some opportunities for acquisition when you when you look at all the different startups that are out there now, um, and even a company like Motorola Solutions that uh, is rumored to be shopping around their wireless land business. Uh, I think SDN is is probably the uh, a, a very good candidate in terms of a market. There's still a whole bunch of so of startups out there um, that can be acquired at any time. So I think. Uh, if I look at the, the, the benchmark companies, um, you, know, you really have to look at companies like Riverbed and maybe Aruba that might be acquisition candidates, um, and whether or not uh, they get acquired by somebody else in the benchmark is, is really difficult to say. I'm not sure that, that anybody else in the benchmark, with the exception of, say, somebody like a Cisco, really has the appetite or the, um, or the financial means to make a, a purchase of, of any of the, of the other companies in the benchmark. I think it's what you'll likely see over the next year, year and a half, is more um, smaller scale acquisitions in some of those segments like security, uh, wireless, and SDS. Apparently somebody wants to dial in a question for you, Scott. I just can't pick it up right now. Uh, we actually had two questions come through. They're both in relation to Cisco. So I'm going to ask them kind of back to back and you can kind of address them. The first one we had come through was, who do you see as Cisco's biggest threat? And the second question that comes through is, what Cisco's position with regards to SBN threat or opportunity? Um, so, uh, two-part question. So, I'll, I'll take the um, the threat first. Uh, I think there's there's no question that the um, the biggest threat from my perspective is is Huawei. Um, you could certainly argue that there are certain competitors in certain segments or geographies that are um, you know, more threatening to Cisco than others, but I think if you look at it on a, an overall scale, there's no question that that uh, that Huawei is the biggest threat to them because of the investments that they're making, and they're really focused on on being the the overall end-to-end -end solutions type of provider, and they're going to be coming at Cisco in every segment, and really using a lot of the same techniques and tactics that they used that made them successful in the telecom side bringing those same kinds of, um, of techniques into the, into the enterprise side as far as coming in as that low-cost option and then penetrating the market and building up a base however they can and then kind of building from there. So they're okay with, with taking the low-margin stuff initially to build up their base, but then as they uh, strengthen those customer relationships and they focus a little bit more on product quality, they can they can bring some of those margins up and become more of a of a uh, quality type of player rather than just a low cost option. Um, as far as, as SDN and, and a threat or opportunity for Cisco, I think it's still a little bit murky from my perspective. Um, I think what Cisco has going for it is they have the ability to invest in whatever uh, in whatever way it would take to, to monetize and take advantage of that opportunity. So even though it certainly is threatening to their business, if you believe that that eventually um, you know switches will become highly commoditized and, and that uh, you know everybody will have uh, you know kind of the white box types of switches, that's certainly threatening to them. 
But if there is money to be made in SDN, then, then Cisco will find a way to do that, whether it's through investing organically or, or continuing to make acquisitions. So as the market develops, I, I still think that we've got a little ways to go to really discover and understand where those revenue opportunities really are and where the money is to be made. And once that starts to come, become a little bit more clear, I think you'll see Cisco head in that direction. Okay. Uh, next we have Scott. How is the rapidly evolving high-performance network computing business impacting the marketplace, in particular Hadoop and similar cluster computing technologies? I think from my perspective, and um, this, this plays a little bit, I think, into the kind of the converged infrastructure space, which uh, we also track within, within TBR as well. But uh, I certainly think there are opportunities there. To me, it comes down to what is the, what are the bandwidth demands within the data center uh, for those kinds of things. So as, as application uh, uh, demand starts to step up, as bandwidth demand in the data center starts to step up and you, and you see, um, you know, new servers coming out and, and the demand for applications in the data center, that's continually going to drive demand for switching. So I really see those two going hand in hand. And this is an area where, you know, you can start to think about SDN and the software defined data center and how that impacts uh, growth within the data center. But I think ultimately um, demand for network infrastructure is really going to uh, be closely tied to demand for um, servers and storage and, and other types of technologies in the data center. And I think by and large, networking has been able to um, avoid some of the commoditization that we've seen there. Uh, whether that continues remains to be seen, but I think um, there's still an understanding and a value in, in, in suppliers able to differentiate themselves a little bit more from a networking point of view in the data center right now as opposed to some of the, the server and storage vendors. Great. Scott, we don't have any other questions in queue, so with that, I think we'll take the time now to wrap up. So I want to thank you for the presentation, and thanks to everyone that joined us today. As I mentioned, I'm going to share all the social media links with you, so I encourage you to follow both Scott and TBR on the Twitter handles listed here, as well as join us on conversations on SlideShare, YouTube, and our LinkedIn channel, uh, where we'll be talking a lot about the research that we're doing uh, going forward. Um, as I mentioned, we are sending the slides out to everyone tomorrow, so if you don't get it by 5 o'clock tomorrow afternoon Eastern Time, check your spam folder. We've had a lot of folks um, have the slides go there on them, uh, so we will be sending those out, so keep an eye out for them. Before you leave, I'd like to ask you to take a brief survey about today's webinar. It's three quick questions. Did you find the presentation valuable? How good was the presenter? And are there any other open-ended comments that you'd like to share with us? We are using your feedback to improve our presentations quarter to quarter, so any information you share with us is greatly appreciated. I'm going to leave the chat function open for another couple of minutes in case anyone has any last-minute questions or would like to set up additional conversations with Scott. And if we don't hear from you now, keep an eye out for our <coughs> webinars coming up in the next quarter. As Scott mentioned, we'll be doing this again in six months, uh, as well as some other thought leadership webinars and other NMP webinars throughout the course of next quarter. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us, and we look forward to hearing from you soon.